Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. <laughs> Wherever you're here might be, it's great to be there. Uh, and it's great to be here where I am. I'm in Brooklyn, and I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge that uh, I, uh, the place that I live is on the unceded ancestral territory of the Muncie Lenape and Canarsie people. Uh, if you have a chance either right now or a little bit later, I'd ask that you visit nativeland.ca. Uh, it may be that you can find out some information about the place that you live and, and the uh, the people that 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 live and uh, lived and currently live there, um, who, whose ancestral territory that might be. I should mention as well that nativeland.ca has a, an API. So if you were the type of person that works with geographic data, perhaps turning latitude and longitude points into place names, this is a great opportunity for you to start or to, con to continue to um, decolonize your practice. Uh, one last thing I want to do before I start is just to say hi to everybody who I know. Um, uh, I know there's a lot of you out there who who I know and I probably haven't seen for a long time. This is the type part of the talk that if I were on stage, I'd be like, hey, hey. So anyways, a little bit of that um, for you as well. I am going to talk uh, today about time. And uh, so I want to start by taking some time. Let's take some time together uh, to do nothing, really. Uh, you can do anything you want. You can get up and pet your dog. You can take a sip of tea, what, whatever you want, as long as it's not checking Twitter or Facebook or Slack or, or the chat room or anything like that. I just, just want us to take uh, just some pure, un unadulterated time. I, I'm just going to take some deep breaths. One of my uh, very favorite all-time data projects uh, was done by this guy and his theater group. This is James Yarker, and his theater group is called Stan's Calf. They're based out of uh, Birmingham in the UK, and it's a project that I've been thinking about a lot in these last two years of numbers. You know, numbers about uh, infections and, and hospitalizations and deaths and and variants, and we, we we've been faced you and I and everyone we know with numbers every day, and these numbers are often intractable. And, and really, this is what this project, um, which is called Of All the People in All the World, is about. Uh, and the, the premise of the project is pretty simple, and it is that these uh, members of Stan's Cafe very carefully count and measure out these piles of rice in which every grain of rice is a person. And so each one of these piles involves a population or a group of people of some kind. So here you see people born in the USA today on the left, people who will die in the USA today on the right. And, and the project is different every time it gets staged. So, so these, these things will sometimes have a theme. So when it was run in London, um, there was a lot of talk about the city itself and about famous people who lived in the city. And as it travels to different places, the idea of it changes. You know, it's this really really, really wonderful thing to see. Um, and it gauges us with these numbers in a way that I think is, is really um, astounding and worth taking some time thinking about. You know, in my book, I talk a lot about the project and its genesis uh, and, and kind of what it feels like to experience it. Um, th this is a pile of rice that involved that is the population of, um, of, of Great Britain at the time. Uh, all these little piles of rice, this long river of rice, each each telling its own little data story. Um, here, here's a pile of rice that is the population of the entire world. Um, 
But what I want to talk about about this project today is its duration. So when you go into the room uh, for for um, for the work, uh, you're not expected to consume this project in a short period of time. You're expected to wander. You're expected to uh, spend maybe an hour, even two hours in the space. And that long term allows you to contemplate the things you're seeing and kind of frame them with the other stories in a way which I think is really interesting. Uh, and, and, and there's this chance to sort of spend some time living with the humanity of this project, because we're not talking about seconds or minutes. We're talking about, in this case, hours and um, and that, that's a time frame that I think is 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 really lovely. But let's get a little bit longer. Uh, I had a chance a few years ago to travel up here. This is the Bow Glacier. It's a glacier up in Banff National Park. It feeds the Bow Lake, which in turn feeds the Bow River, which runs through the city of Calgary and provides about half of the city's drinking water. Um, when, when we went up to the glacier, we were there to install this seismic uh, observatory, which is a set of sensors um, all solar powered that measure the seismic activity of the glacier. The glaciers are actually pretty chatty. They're, they're noisy things. They, they make a lot of shifts and cracks. And, and we wanted to take that data, um, which is very active, and, and send it in real time or as close to real time we could into the city of Calgary, where we built an installation in this gigantic plaza in front of a brand new building called Brookfield Place. And so the plaza itself is actually warped. The paving stones are warped to match the um, topography of the glacier. And then the data arrives into the plaza in real time where it is um, played on a 16 channel sound system and, and also visualized on this um, 20 foot tall and 30 foot wide light sculpture and so the idea of this project is is to really literally bring the voice of the glacier into the city um, the the fact is that most of us don't get a chance to see these things uh, or if we do it's it's once in a while um, and these natural spaces whether they be glaciers or forests or or wetlands uh, they they are both physically and conceptually distant from us and and so what we wanted to do with Har Harold Harbinger, which is the name of the project, was to kind of force a situation in which you have to be closer to this thing. And so these people uh, who who walk through this plaza every day on their way to work or to catch the light rail or to get on the bus are going to hear this glacier and it becomes not only part of the soundscape of the city, but part of their own brains in a way uh, that I think is meaningful. And, and the reason why this works is that it occurs over a long duration. So even though you might experience this piece in a very small chunk of time, those small chunks of time add up over the years. So if you're a child that grows up in Calgary, this is a piece that, that should exist um, for the rest of your life. And um, you know, very specifically, with with glaciers, this is a, an object, a natural object, whose lifespan is vastly different than our own. And and standing on a glacier or visiting a mountain range or climbing a mountain uh, inevitably gets us or or asks us or in some cases forces us to consider these timelines, which are vastly different than our own kind of um, lives. And and so the the piece was to intended to try to have that same effect. Um, every day in the city. And of course, we wanted to also speak about this inevitability of the glacier's uh, retreat. Uh, we know that this glacier is going to be um, gone, uh, whether that is in a few decades or, or in a century, uh, it's going to happen. And, and, and when we were asked to design this piece, when we explained the idea, it was important for the building that this thing lasted. And so we were asked to make this piece last for uh, at least 40 years, which is a vastly different time frame that I, uh, than I was used to working um, when I talk about data. In 1982, as part of Documenta 7, the artist Joseph Boys planted 7,000 oak trees across the city of Kassel in Germany. And his intent here was, as he described it, to alter the city itself on a long-term basis. That the idea that these trees would exist, the lifespan of, of these particular trees is about 150 years. So that this piece would 
would um, would ex exist again for the duration of people's lifespans. Um, 17 years later in 1999, the artist and provoc provocateur and engineer, Natalie Jeremijenko, uh, took a page from Joseph Boy's uh, and, and planted uh, what was intended to be a thousand trees, uh, pairs of trees across the uh, Bay Area uh, in, 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 in California. And what was different about this project is that these trees were clones. They were genetically identical clones of a tree um, called a paradox walnut, which is a hybrid walnut that is meant to be especially vigorous. This is what an adult paradox walnut looks like. And so working with community members, um, gardeners, children, city workers, uh, in, in 1999 and into 2000, they planted these pairs of trees all across the city. And the foundational idea of the One Trees Project, which is what this is called, is that because these trees are genetically identical, um, they would act as, as what Natalie called social registers of the city. So trees that existed in these really beautiful places like this one, um, where, where they're getting watered and where the air quality is really good, would grow to be vigorous. Whereas trees that might be planted in industrial areas or in areas with high pollution um, it would, would, would not grow as well. And indeed, trees that were planted in places that got developed, which happened many, many, many times with this project, um, those trees wouldn't exist at all. I had the chance um, when I was writing my book to to visit the project and to um, uh, go and look at some of these trees. And there was something really astounding to be able to look at these trees, not just as trees, although they're beautiful in themselves, but as these registers, as these records of, uh, you know, 20, 20 years at the time of, of the city's progress. And indeed, each one of the pairs of trees was different. And I stood in many places where the trees should have been and there weren't. And I stood underneath the beautiful shade of this particular pair of trees and had this chance to think about the city's development over time. Time in, in a way that I don't think a map or the traditional ways that we would visualize the kind of urban history would happen. And, and then there's also like the fact that when I was done this, I could feel this project in my legs. It lasted for this really long time, which is really the intent of this project. And Natalie talks about the, the fact that the, these crises that we're facing, they kind of unfold on timelines that are vastly different from, from the timeline of the types of media that we're used to working with. Um, and, 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 and this to me is, is something that has really, really stuck with me about, about this particular project. And, and paradox walnuts uh, can live even more um, than 600 years, but they have a kind of median lifespan of 600 years, which means that this project will continue to exist, certainly for our own lifespans and that of our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. Well, you, you, you get the idea. Um, in the city of Utrecht, uh, in the Dutch city of, of Utrecht, um, since the year 2000, since January 1st, 2000, a group of poets have been inscribing a poem into the cobblestones of the city. Um, this project is called Letters of Art Utrecht, and every Saturday, um, whoever the designated poet is at the time removes one of the city's cobblestones and replaces it with a letter. So every Saturday, a new letter um, is added to the poem and and so over a very long period of time you can see the numbers inscribed here the poem tells itself and the poets will 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 have a chance to write into this poem for a few years and then a new poet will take over and so on and so on and so on so this is another durational project but what really gets me excited about this one in particular is the idea of its collaborative nature and and also just what you see in this in this project or in this picture there's like you can't help but see and experience this project because you're walking over it you're driving over it you're riding your bicycle over it it doesn't occur in any type of precious place it incur it occurs quite literally um, in the stones of the street and um, when we talk about <laughs> we talk about time spans here there's lots of different ways to measure it right we started with a minute we went uh, we went we went to hours and, and years and decades and even up to centuries. Uh, but I love this particular time span. There's something really poetic about it. This idea that the the intent of the project was to continue for as long as there's Saturdays. 
as long as they're Saturdays. Where am I going with all of this? What am I talking about? Uh, you might have you might have seen this paper. It, it came out um, a few weeks ago, uh, and, and and the researchers uh, who authored this paper um, were interested in in what they call beauty and how it affected the ways that we that that we ex we experience data visualization. And so, to to make a long story short, um, they collected data visualizations from places like academic papers and Reddit, and they got a bunch of people on Mechanical Turk to evaluate those things um, by uh, whether they thought they were beautiful, how understandable they were, and and a lot of other categories. And then using that that data, the things that they learned, um, they, they, they made their own data visualizations of the same data and then did versions of it, which they believe uh, were, were in some cases more beautiful. And their definitions of beauty they learned from the previous step. And, and they were things like, uh, uh, like unconventional typefaces or, or very bright color palettes. So like, for example, this is, this is the non-beautiful version of this particular graphic. And here's a beautiful version of that particular graphic. I'm sorry. Um, I, I love this type of scholarship, and I don't mean to um, make fun of it at all. I, <laughs> this is another beautiful um, version of, of, of that thing. But what was interesting to me about reading the paper um, was this, and that is that uh, when they were another, sorry, another beautiful graphic, um, when they when they were trying to, to figure out um, which which records they would include in the project, they said they wouldn't include any record in which the mechanical turker, uh, and this should be less than, by the way, looked at this graphic for less than eight seconds. Uh, and they wouldn't also include um, any um, situation in which anybody looked, this should be, should be greater than, uh, looked at this graphic for more than two and a third minutes. This really tells me something about the way that we expect uh, people to engage with the work that we're doing. Um, and on October 27th, 1994, uh, the first banner ad was published. This is what it looked like, a really sophisticated piece of design. Um, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it, it was designed by uh, this man, um, Louis Rosetto, who was uh, at, at the, one of the co-founders of Wired. And, and, and he talks about this experience, right? this idea that um, they, 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 they were told or the society was telling them not to do this thing, like not to turn the internet into a... Uh, a, um, a a commercial place, but they did it anyways, uh, and 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 that was this real moment that changed the internet world because this thing, which is called the browser, right? Think about the experience of browsing. It's a nice thing, right? Go browse. You're taking your time. Uh, turned into a vehicle for ad delivery, and all of us who work on the web, um, we make work for a vehicle for ad delivery, and as such. Our time skills that we use to expect people to engage with our work are extremely short. What do we what do we do as data visualizers? What is what is our job? What is the what is the thing that we do? Does it match this idea um, of this urgency of this kind of rush? Well, I, you know, I would argue fundamentally that there are some things that we are trying to do. Uh, we're trying to build trust. Uh, we are trying to build understanding. Uh, of course, we're, we're trying to build knowledge. And I would even go as far, um, particularly with the current political climate, that we are often trying to build belief. Now, what I want you to do, and this is uh, the provocation that I will end this talk with, is to think about the times in your life where you have in your own life built trust and understanding and knowledge or belief. And I'd like you to think about the time scales in which that happened. Uh, because one thing that I can almost say for sure is that that time scale was longer than two and a third minutes. Thank you.